Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Last Wrestling Podcast, because if I have a wrestling podcast, Kent is here! Yes, after a couple very long days in my real life, I finally had time to sit down and watch AEW Beach Break, or AEW Dynamite Beach Break, and the only thing anyone's talking about coming out of this show is Kenta's debut as his New Japan character, as his member of Bullet Club, the Go to Sleep Club, appearing in America on AEW Dynamite. And wow... I'm glad that's the only thing people are talking about coming out of the show, because the rest of the show wasn't that great. We will get to the rest of the show momentarily. Uh, so, does this mean there's an official alliance between New Japan and AEW? Maybe? Kinda? I don't know, and neither does anybody else, I don't think. But, the storyline of John Moxley having to defend his United States Championship against Kenta, that has finally bled over. That is finally started because that right to challenge briefcase thing's been going on for basically a year now and i i am so happy that this is actually making news although kenta um sir as as much as i i enjoyed yelling at you to go back to nxt at wrestle kingdom over a year ago um that hair uh don't just just don't that that just don't that looks horrible <laughs> This also does kind of explain why uh, the Bullet Club were using Bullet Club uh, a week or so ago, even though AEW doesn't necessarily have the rights to that name. Actually, they don't have the rights to that name at all. So maybe that's part of the deal, is New Japan, who's now going to be on a Roku channel, apparently. A uh, New Japan gets some mainstream exposure uh, on network television, on cable television, first-tier you know, first cable, and in exchange, they let everybody use their names. There was also something that I... I don't know how many other people caught this. At the very, very end, when they had the little AEW copyright thing at the bottom of the screen, Kenny, is, Kenny Omega is in the ring, his foot on John Moxley's chest, with some really cool-looking tights, by the way. Kenta is on the outside, looking up, and he just very subtly sort of shakes his head, looking at the former leader of Bullet Club. And, uh, yeah, he ain't part of Bullet Club no more. So, is this going to be a Bullet Club America versus Bullet Club Japan type of thing? Are we going to see some some civil war within the Japanese faction? Sitting, you know, who's on Kenta's side, who's on Kenny's side? I don't know. My little you know, armchair booker brain is going 100 miles an hour right now, and we still got the whole rest of the two hours to talk about so we're going to be taking a look at the rest of this show in chronological order and that means we're starting off with the tag team battle royal and i have notes uh first of all a quick talk on the set with the surfboards and the fake palm trees and some of that stuff uh frankly that looked kind of lame but i would prefer this to them doing something dangerous like trying to actually do a show on a public beach because there are a lot of people in America and a lot of people in Florida that um, are probably going to the public beach and not wearing their masks. So, very glad we're keeping this in Daly's place that's at least somewhat of a controlled environment. Uh, major, uh, two, right, on to the actual Battle Royal itself. One, why are we doing the Bucks Bucks in this Battle Royal? The, the fake dollar bills that none of the fans are going home with are all over the ring, all over the ramp, all over the, uh, around the ringside area, it looked tacky, it looked cheap, and the rest of the set didn't help on that. Uh, but the big plot hole that I saw here, didn't we just have a story about how there's now only one official tag team in the inner circle that's going to be going after the tag team titles? Why did, why did they have six members of the inner circle... They had Sammy Hager, they had um, uh, Proud and Powerful, and they had uh, the actual tag team of Jericho and MJF. Now, AEW has a pretty deep tag team roster, and if the idea is give everybody a shot to face the Bucks at uh, Revolution for the tag team titles, why not throw Bear Country in there? Why not throw uh, you know some of these other guys in there? And... Of course, the obvious reason is that they wanted to continue the inner circle breaking apart angle, and that's fine, but 
in, th in that case, maybe don't do the official tag team thing because you've already sort of established this and you're going back on your own continuity now. Um, the Good Brothers show up, and my question is, who is letting the Good Brothers into the building? Because they don't actually work here. What kind of an invasion storyline is this? We haven't had anything established that, at least so far, that Impact wrestlers are allowed to just show up. Um, they did try to cover that towards the, the main event. The Good Brothers were booked for the main event. Actually, okay, just talked myself out of that. They were allowed in the building because they're booked for the main event. Fair enough. Um, but this alongside the Royal Rumble, kind of devaluing the Battle Royal these days, because the whole, there's no disqualifications in a Battle Royal. So, okay, does that mean there are no rules either? I mean, the, uh, between this and uh, almost eliminating people when he's from the Royal Rumble when he's not even in the match, we someone needs to clean up the Battle Royal. Insert a 10 count. Insert a disqualification rule make this match actually make sense. Okay, um, before we move on to the next segment, am I the only one thinking that Jim Ross is giving some serious uh, Bernie Sanders at the inauguration vibes here? It just it, it, He just needs the mittens. That's all he needs is the mittens. Up next, we had a hype vignette for Jade. Uh, she has a great look. She looks incredibly powerful. We see her lifting heavy things. Here's the problem. I know nothing about this character other than she is where Shaquille O'Neal has deposited all of his charisma. Uh, who is this woman? Where is she from? How does she and Shaquille O'Neal know each other? Are they, I don't think they're married, and I'm sure he's married. I just don't know who, too. Uh, what are her goals in AEW? Uh, why does she fight? Am I supposed to cheer her or boo her? I don't know, and that is annoying. Uh, next, we have a Darby Allen Sting promo, to which my initial reaction was, please don't let Sting talk. Uh, we find out that Joey Janela has a title match for the TNT Championship that apparently came out of absolutely nowhere. <sighs> Fine, whatever. Uh, Taz interrupts before either Ar uh, Darby Allen or Sting get a chance to say anything. That's a good thing. Neither of these two are particularly strong on the microphone. Darby Allen has promo strengths in other areas. And Sting has never been a good promo. Sting is good when he has a three-second catchphrase and he looks intimidating, which even at his age and all that face paint, he can still look intimidating. One thing I did like was they gave a good excuse for Team Taz to not actually be in the building. They've been suspended after attacking AEW staff members uh, either last week or the week previous. So that's good. Uh, Sting, unfortunately, then did get a chance to talk. And, wow, he is just a bad, bad promo. Your AEW is very good at pre-taped vignettes. Be better than this. All right, up next we have Britt Baker, who is a dentist, versus Thunder Rosa. And I admit, I, I'd heard good things about Thunder Rosa before I started seeing her in AEW. Yeah, that lived. She lives. she's living up to the hype here. Um, I love Rebel slash Reba. I love the fact that she is just all in on this. She is probably the best manager in AEW right now as far as you know, convincing me that she's really trying to cheer on this woman that she's clearly in an abusive relationship with. The wrestlers around ringside who are there to make noise, none of them are wearing masks. They should be wearing masks. Set a good example. If you're yelling, we can still hear you. If you're worried about us not being able to see your face as I hit my microphone for no reason, your job is not to get over right now. Your job is to make noise. So put on your mask, set a good example, and make some damn noise. One thing that they kept bringing up in this match on the commentary is that, and actually in the uh, pre-match promo as well by Britt Baker, who is a dentist, uh, was the idea that I'm going to be the face of the AEW women's division. What the fuck does that mean? No, what is that? Is that I'm going to be the champion? Because this isn't a title match. This isn't a number one contenders match. This isn't a get into the top five match. This isn't a fight for five. So what, what are you actually trying to accomplish here? This is a blood feud with a delusional heel who thinks she's the gatekeeper to the AEW roster and that Thunder Rosa doesn't belong here and she's wrong because she's delusional. That's the story. Tell the story you're telling. 
unless you want to define what face of the company means, don't say people want to be face of the company. However, on the positive side, and there's a lot of positive in this match, that was probably the best women's match I've seen, seen in AEW in a long time. AEW gets a lot of crap, some of it deserved, some of it not, but most of it deserved, on how weak their women's roster is. And it seems to me they're taking legitimate steps to correct that. And Thunder Rosa is a great talent. I'm glad they kind of brought her in from the NWA. That does seem to be kind of, at least temporarily, out of business. I was very impressed with all three of the characters in this match, including Reba slash Rebel. I'm not really ready to award AEW the Sonic the Hedgehog Award yet, as far as correcting problems that the fans have pointed out, but definite step in the right direction. After all, it's a step in the right direction. It's a step in the right direction after all. Wow, that's a reference no wrestling fan's gonna get, is it? Okay, we then have a, a backstage interview with Hardy and Hangman Adam Page, and it's a return of AEW audio issues, because we could hear everything that was being said was being echoed through the house mics that we were also picking up. That, that's just sad at this point. Uh, the one, one serious note, I'm not sure I like the idea of Brody Lee Jr. of Negative One being used in storylines. Uh, this is an elementary school child. This seems kind of exploitative, quite frankly. I don't think it's crossed the line quite yet, but it's, it's close. Leave the children out of this, please. Especially if you've got the child running around with a frickin' kendo stick. Uh, Shinai, it's actually what it's called, of course. Yeah, not a fan of that. I am enjoying the Big Money Matt character, because that's one of his better heel gimmicks, and it's one he hasn't had a chance to use in public before. As for the actual match with Chaos Project... My main note here is I want to love Serpentico. I want to love a practitioner of the snake style. But I just don't get it with Luther. I mean, I granted, I never knew this guy before his AEW run. He's a deathmatch veteran who doesn't do deathmatch stuff. And the only character he's got, the only personality he has is he's weird. At least three times in this match, the commentators pointed out, well, that's a weird cat, man. He's just a weird guy, you know? I said, okay, cool. How is he weird? What is weird about him? Luther needs an actual character. Up next, we get a preview of the women's tournament, and I tentatively like this. My big question is, is this going to happen on TV, or is this going to be shunted off to YouTube again the way the tag team tournament was? Uh, some good names in the bracket, but I'm, at, I'm wondering... Do they not have a top five for the women anymore, or is that has that been completely abandoned? How are they doing this? Is this going to be done, like, at stardom shows, or what? I mean, there's, there's no way they're getting this many people into the country. So, yeah, these are the matches that are emanating from Japan. So, if there is actually now a deal with New Japan, remember, they're owned by the same parent company as stardom, is that part of it? Is, you know, we want to do a women's tournament, let us use stardom, and, you know, Bushi Road or whoever owns them now says, okay, yeah, sure. I, I don't get that. But I'm looking forward to this tournament. I hope they actually do it on Dynamite and, you know, culminate it at a, pre, at a pay-per-view. Though it says, they said in February we're doing this. Well, tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. If you're going to do a 16-woman a tournament, a uh, single elimination tournament, you better get, you better get on it. Unless you're going to be releasing this whole thing to YouTube, aren't you? Bugger. All right. Uh, Inner Circle promo. They're still breaking up. And we're starting to see what the teams are going to be. Other than that, nothing accomplished. And then the wedding happens. My, and my, here are my notes exactly. The wedding. That's it. Honestly, I see what they were trying to do with this. And I love a subverted trope as much as the next Marky Bastard. But... This was just dumb, and it accomplished almost nothing narratively. Um, I liked the, the Sinister Minister James Mitchell showing up. Uh, he's always been one of my favorite sort of character actors in wrestling. And I, I did like the—I I, I laughed at the line, kayfabing all others, 
And I like the idea, oh, we've got a suspiciously human-shaped package here. Let's destroy it, etc., etc. Let's Let's not do the does anyone object thing. But what, what was accomplished here? Okay, officially, the two are married. Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford, or Penelope Sabian, are now married. Cool. And what else? What else happened? The, the feud between that group and the best friends is still going on. Chuck Taylor isn't the butler anymore, I think. Because I understand the stipulation was you're the butler until the wedding. Wedding's over. So if anything, the storyline has actually gone backwards. Just get Miro the hell away from this and let him break people. Let Miro crush. Uh, then we get a snippet with Shaquille O'Neal, and Shaquille O'Neal is very bad at the professional wrestling. Seriously, I I've yet to see one thing this man has done in an AEW environment that makes me think this match is going to be anything other than a complete shit show. And I think the fact that this has been moved to the Dynamite before the pay-per-view kind of tells it all. All right, up next, we've got Eddie Kingston versus Lance Archer. First thought, who's the babyface? Second thought, when did they make this a lumberjack match? Third thought, why aren't the lumberjacks wearing masks? Is that a good example, AEW? That's supposed to be your gimmick. Uh, other notes from within the match... Ha ha, Archer hurt himself. Slow the F down and tell us a story. Does JR know what match he's calling? Some of these lumberjack shots look like absolute shit and Archer isn't even reacting to them. I love some of the subtle, dirty fighting that Kingston's doing. There is exactly one lumberjack with the mask. And then uh, Kingston hits the back fist to the future. And I keep thinking that AEW needs to bring in Archibald Peck for a one-off that nobody is going to understand because we need to fulfill a time loop prophecy. Seriously, though, very, very good match that I don't think needed the Lumberjack stipulation. It really, really didn't. These two needed to beat the crap out of each other one-on-one. -on -one. Eddie Kingston is so, 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 so good at this exact kind of character and story that you don't need to put a hat on a hat with these guys. All right, up next we get a quick promo from FTR that I think we've now established means Fear the Revolution. It took me a couple of minutes to realize that Jack means Jungle Boy. And then they have apparently shut up Marco Stunt which means we have a face turn that has been achieved through felony kidnapping because there are no police in wrestling. At last, we get to the main event, the six-man tag, that unfortunately did not matter at all because this was only a setup for the Kenta angle at the end. Fine. But this was actually a really good match, and... You know how WWE's been looking for the next Rey Mysterio for the last 10 years? Well, we found him. His name's Rey Phoenix. On the middle rope, spin kick to the face, runs across the ring, jumps not only through the ropes, through the guy, onto the crowd barricade. This is absolutely nuts. I, I know how good Phoenix is because I saw him in, in Lucha Underground, but wow, Phoenix is still really, really, really good. Take this man, get him into some color, get him into a red flaming mask, and push him to the goddamn moon. I mean, yes, I get the tag team with the brother, I get the death triangle thing. Get him out of that. So yeah, those are my quick thoughts on Beach Break. Overall thoughts, final thoughts, if you will. One story and one story only coming out of this show, and it came in the last uh, 120 seconds of the, of the show. Um, the rest of the show was meh. Had some good moments, had some inconsistent storytelling, had some stuff that made absolutely no goddamn sense. Anytime AEW does a branded episode of Dynamite, they do something interesting. So, good for them. Uh, the next AEW show I'm going to be covering is probably going to be Revolution. That will be a full live-ish review. I'm going to see if I can edit this down to under... Oh, it's over 22 minutes already. Bugger, I talk a lot. Uh, thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and do all, enable notifications, do all that YouTube stuff. And I will see you at the next show. Catchphrase sign-off.